Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who join us on WebEx and to who is now watching this video. We have the pleasure to welcome you virtually today for an event organized on the eve of the first meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the Escazú Agreement, taking place in Santiago de Chile in hybrid format from tomorrow to Friday um, this week, um, when we will be celebrating uh, Mother Earth uh, Day around the world. Preparatory meetings are already taking place uh, today, and we are therefore very grateful to the leading experts actively involved uh, in the process for having joined us uh, today. Our event today is co-organized by the Geneva Environment Network, Earth Justice, and the European Eco Forum. The ESCAZU agreement is the regional agreement on access to information, public participation, and justice in environmental matters in Latin America and the Caribbean. It was adopted in ESCAZU in Costa Rica four years ago and enter into force uh, on 22 April last year, as we were celebrating International Mother Earth Day. We are delighted to have uh, with us uh, various representatives from member states, from Latin America and the Caribbean, and from civil society. Joining us from Chile, where the prayer meetings are starting, uh, or uh, elsewhere in Latin America, or from Geneva. We are also delighted to have with us uh, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, serving as Technical Secretariat for the Agreement. The meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the Escazú Agreement has significance beyond its region. The equivalent uh, instrument uh, at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, the UNEC Arrows Convention, to mark this important moment and discuss perspectives from other regions on what is taking place this week in Chile, we are also delighted to have with us the chair of the Arus Convention Bureau, as well as civil society representatives active in that fora. They are joining us from various parts of Europe. It is also to be highlighted that uh, five months ago, the, uh, at the Human Rights Council, a resolution recognizing the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment uh, was adopted. Uh, the Escazú Agreement and its first regional conference of the parties comes therefore uh, as a further step in strengthening everyone's ability to act to protect ecosystems and to respond to the triple, triple planetary crisis challenges. Before we go into depth on the topic we are discussing uh, today, let me remind you that the documents presented, the summary as well as the video of the event will be made available on the web page of this event. The link is being shared uh, in the chat. Throughout the event, you can raise questions by using the Q&A uh, box. We will use your questions to feed the discussion at, at the end of the event. Yves Lador, the representative of Earth Justice in Geneva, will moderate uh, the event today and will be introducing the speakers as they speak. He will take over after the opening remarks. And to welcome you to this event and delivering uh, opening remarks, it is our pleasure to welcome virtually uh, Jeremy Waits, the Secretary General of the European uh, Environment Bureau, the European Environment Bureau is part of the European Eco Forum, the ad hoc coalition of environmental citizens, organizations and other NGOs acting in the um, UNEC region and co-organizing this event. It is also to be highlighted that Jeremy, before occupying his current position, was the secretary of the Arrows Convention. We are therefore looking forward to his comments on this landmark moment. Jeremy, over to you. Well, thank you, Diana, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to everyone. It's, uh, it's really a great honor and pleasure to join this event. And um, yeah, special congratulations to, uh, to those of you joining from the, the region of Latin America and Caribbean uh, on what is really a defining moment in the evolution, not just of the Escazo Agreement, but also more generally of participatory democracy. Um, in that region. Um, there was a time when we might have assumed that the march towards democracy and democratization was somehow inevitable. 20 years ago, when the Oros Convention held its first, the first meeting of its governing body, the meeting of the parties uh, in Lucca, Italy, I was probably one of those optimists who took that for granted. I'm still an optimist today, but it is impossible to ignore the threats to democracy that are facing our world today and how they've escalated in recent years, notably through the rise of autocrats, demagogues and dictators, often in their positions through having fiddled the electoral system or having restricted the media so that the result does not accurately reflect the will of the people. No region has a monopoly on this kind of bad behaviour and in Europe, 
we find it in some of the oldest democracies as well as some of the newer ones. Uh, there are problems that are faced on both sides of the Atlantic and I'm sure uh, all of you on this call are very well aware of that. Russia's brutal war against Ukraine takes it to another level, but it is part of the same general trend. So we need to be vigilant. The kind of democracy that's represented by the Escazu Agreement and the Oris Convention, uh, which we generally call participatory democracy, recognizes that the involvement of the public in decision making should not be limited to occasional participation in more or less fair elections but should involve ongoing input of the public to certain types of decisions through structured participatory processes where the right to information and the right to appeal decisions are uh, uh, flanking the, the right to participate itself. And I think this participatory democracy concept also reflects the recognition that exposing decision making by public authorities to public scrutiny generally improves the quality of decision making. And we all know that governments alone will not be able to tackle the major environmental problems of our time, whether we talk about climate change, biodiversity loss, ubiquitous plastic pollution in our oceans and so on, uh, that we need to have a whole of society effort involving government, in involving businesses, and inv involving the, the public and all the range of, of stakeholders there. Um, and having, uh, uh, mechanisms that actually enable the public to participate in the decision making gives increases the chances that pu the public will believe uh, in those solutions and will put their back into realizing it because we it's not just about fitting some pollution controls on the end of a chimney it's about changing the whole way we do things the way we move around the way we house ourselves feed ourselves and so on so it really does involve a a, a, a huge uh, transition in society whether the public, the general public, need to play a central role in that. Having served as secretary to the Oris Convention, as you mentioned, Diana, for it was actually for more than a decade from 1999 onward, I've got some idea of the kind of preparations that have gone into this week's COP uh, and also the importance of establishing a strong foundation for such a treaty. It's fairly standard for MEAs, for multilateral environmental agreements, to adopt rules of procedure or to put in place financial arrangements and sometimes also to establish mechanisms supporting implementation and compliance. But what is special about Escazu and about Orvis is that the principles of transparency and participation, which are what the, those treaties are about, can and indeed should be reflected in those operational structures and, and mechanisms. So I'm very happy to see those issues on the agenda uh, though I'm going to leave it to others to comment on the actual proposals that have been tabled, not not so much for diplomatic reasons. I don't think I'm diplomatic enough for that, but actually because others are, are more are better informed uh, on that than I am. Uh, but I must say, looking across the Atlantic from from Europe, I, it's so encouraging and inspiring to see the progress that's been made in in a short time, a relatively short time. Uh, and yeah, I think this is this is an important week where we can have some good news uh, amidst the background of uh, bad news. And I hope that the, the collaboration that's been uh, going on between Europe uh, and the Latin America Caribbean region in, in the helping the development uh, of the agreement, the Escazu agreement uh, will continue. And I, I hope that's uh, it, it been, been helpful. I, I see some people on the call from the European side who've, who've tried to share our experiences, but of course, every region has to do it its own way and find its own solutions. And it's been encouraging to see in some aspects of the Escazu agreement uh, that have picked up issues that were somehow missed, I think, when Horus was, was being negotiated. So I, I probably run to the limit of my time there. I'm really looking forward to, to hearing uh, the other speakers uh, on this, uh, in this session. So I'm gonna hand back to, I think I'm handing to Eve now as the moderator from this point on. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. I'm looking forward to listening to the discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, and I hope you can all hear me well. And uh, welcome also to everybody where are, wherever you are from. And uh, we want to greet, indeed, as you did, Jeremy, all our friends from uh, the Latin American region, because this is definitely a time to celebrate with them and to congratulate them for 
this achievement of this first uh, conference of the parties of the uh, Eskazu Agreement. And thank you, Jeremy, for having uh, brought all your historical perspective as being one of the uh, person at the very origin of uh, the equivalence that we have in our region of the Eskazu Convention, which is called the Aorus Convention. And we'll have the opportunity to hear a number of testimonies and, and point of views on how we see this uh, these new instruments coming into force and now having its first meeting of the parties, uh, strengthening at a global level uh, the question of an environmental democracy. And so, as the Eskazu Agreement has been adopted, as the name indicates very clearly in Eskazu, uh, we would like to start with uh, by, by turning ourselves to uh, Costa Rica, uh, where precisely the agreement was uh, adopted. So, let me start by giving the floor to Mr. Roberto. Cespedes Gomez, who is a minister counselor at the permanent mission of Costa Rica here in Geneva at the, uh, for, towards the, uh, the United Nations. Roberto, thank you very much for being with us. Um, it's great to have you and, it, and it's great to have Costa Rica because you have played quite a role in the, um, the adoption of this, uh, of, uh, of this, of this instrument. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eve, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you uh, to all the organizers of this event for, for having Costa Rica. As you mentioned, Eve, we have been playing a, a, um, a role in the upcoming, um, or, or the process of the Eskazu Agreement that is, has led us finally to the first COP, for which we are very excited. Um, I've been a presiding officer in the Eskazu process for almost three years now, now in Geneva, but back in, in San Jose. So it's an issue that is also very close to, to my heart and to my work. And uh, as was said at the beginning of, of the meeting, uh, this first cup of the Eskazu agreement comes uh, very timely when we are, you know, st still facing and will increasingly face uh, the hardships of the multi-faced uh, environmental crisis, pollution, climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, ocean management. These are all interrelated and we are seeing how uh, they are being much more uh, aggravated by the fact that we as a whole, as an international community, as humanity, are not doing enough for these uh, uh, crises. And so the first uh, meeting of the parties, the first COP of the Eskazu Agreement will provide very good tools uh, to all Latin American countries that have signed it. And even some, in some cases, those have uh, not yet signed it um, with the various tools to improve on the way they are conducting uh, their, their business and how they can involve, as uh, Jeremy was saying, people in a more democratic and participatory way. Because in, in the end, Eskazu is about bringing a new uh, mindset in democracy, a new way of doing things in which, uh, as Jeremy was saying, not only are, are there benefits of exposing public decisions, but there are benefits of preventing that exposure and working together from the beginning uh, to avoid any environmental harm. And that is, in the end, the spirit of Escazú. It's to bring people together to uh, solve the issues that are more present for them in their local communities and allow for much more legitimate and participatory plans decisions to be implemented so that they, when they come uh, to fruition, they do not face backlash or even uh, judicial consequences. And of course, avoid environmental harm and guarantee the right to a healthy environment. As uh, it was also said uh, last year here in Geneva, uh, together with a, a group of countries, we spearheaded the efforts for the global recognition of a right to a healthy environment. And of course, the human rights that are enshrined into the Eskazu Agreement are the procedural part of that right. And without the procedural part, that right is very difficult to implement. And that is why uh, the recognition of the right to a healthy environment and the first uh, COP of the Eskazu Agreement have a lot in common because they have the potential to start implementing the right to a healthy environment in Latin America and elsewhere. Um, 
as you know, you know, in 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 the work that has been done to uh, come to this call, the, there are many many topics that will be touched upon. But you know the the rules of procedure of the COP and the rules of the compliance committee are important steps that need to be agreed upon because they will provide the the base work for uh, people and states to take advantage of this agreement and to uh, grasp at the opportunities that it offers. And so we expect that uh, these uh, negotiations go smoothly. There's been a lot of work done in the past two and a half years on these issues as well as on the financial side, which is another important aspect. There's also one key aspect of the SK2 agreement that is a bit uh, new and that is perhaps sets it aside from uh, the ARPUS convention, and it's about the human rights defenders and provisions for them. And this is a, is a huge step that countries need to undertake once the agreement, once the first COP is uh, finished, and that we need to get uh, to work on discussing how to protect the work and lives and of uh, environmental human rights defenders and their contributions to the environment. Because in the end, these people, as, as has been said at the beginning of the meeting, they are the ones who are bringing about the most radical and transformative changes. States need to work with them more closely and need to protect and guarantee that they can exercise their rights uh, freely and without uh, fear of prosecution or harassment and of course uh, without any kind of threats. And so the SKSU agreement having uh, specifically provisions for this uh, would allow for a rich discussion and eventually some sort of measures, uh, either recommendations or an agreed uh, uh, rules on how to better come to this uh, end of protecting human rights defenders. Uh, as you know, and I, uh, of course, cannot, cannot uh, stop mention at this, Costa Rica has not yet ratified the agreement. We are part and we are still the, until tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, the presidency of the board, but this will be handed over to a, a new presidency as per the rules of the first COP. But we are still strong, strong supporters of the agreement. We are very politi uh, politically and uh, committed to it. And we hope uh, for our uh, Congress to ratify as soon as possible. But I was also uh, saying at the beginning that even for countries like us, uh, the agreement is already part uh, of our uh, of our uh, legislation. Why? Because we have constitutional provisions that allow for human rights agreements that have been signed and even not ratified to be used by Costa Rican citizens in the in constitutional courts. And this, on top of the uh, uh, consultory opinion of the Inter-American Courts of Human, of Human Rights 2317 of a few years back, that touches upon the rights of the ESA Clause Agreement, makes it possible for everyone that is part of the Inter-American uh, Human Rights System to access the agreement. And so, uh, Ratification will come soon for us. Uh, congratulations to all the countries that have already uh, ratified and that are going to be taking part in this uh, first meeting of the parties in Chile. And uh, let's, uh, let's hope that the outcome is great and especially that the agreement can begin to be implemented and can be made uh, accessible to all uh, communities in Latin America and the Caribbean for it to be put into practice and become a, a useful tool for the implementation of the right to a healthy environment and the well-being of all of our uh, citizens in the region. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop there, but uh, uh, thank you again and uh, I'm eager and I'll remain here if uh, you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto. And, and indeed, uh, I think everybody looks forward to the ratification of uh, the convention of the agreement by Costa Rica, knowing precisely what you have said, the important role it has played in the developing of this, uh, of this instrument. So everybody's looking forward to that. So now uh, let's turn to another Latin American country, 
uh, who has also been very active. And I'm very happy to give the floor now to uh, Mr. Walter Schultz, who is the Director of Environment and Sustainable Development at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Human Mobility of Ecuador. Walter, thank you very much for being with us. It's really great to have you here in this discussion. Um, not only you're a prominent uh, person in the environmental negotiations, but you've also been uh, very active here in Geneva with the human right, in the human rights field. So you are definitely uh, a high level speaker in this discussion uh, for your knowledge between the two fields, uh, human rights and environment. So uh, Walter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Eve, and, and uh, also to Diane and to all the organizers for, for the invitation. Um, as, as several others uh, have, have described it uh, throughout this, this the, the entry into force, the adoption and the entry into force of, of Escazú is, is indeed a historic uh, achievement for, for a region for many reasons, including, of course, uh, being the first environmental treaty uh, for Latin America and also for including specific provisions for the protection and promotion of human rights defenders in environmental matters, but also for providing uh, every member of our society with a fundamental tool to, to fully enjoy and defend the rights of environmental information, to participate in the environmental decisions and to access environmental justice and at large to access democracy uh, in, in, in a larger sense. Of course, the challenge is now implementation. So uh, also very pleased to to, to uh, and joining um, James in the sense of the, the importance of, of the establishment at this COP uh, one on the structure and functions of the compliance uh, and, and implementation committee. Uh, we, are, we are probably supporting the proposals there to have it fully transparent uh, and, and enhancing a mechanism for that. Um, we have participated in, in throughout the process, as, as you mentioned, of the negotiation uh, and, and during the ratification uh, discussion or, already uh, within our country, we, we develop uh, simultaneously our first action plan for an open government, uh, which included an, an early diagnosis of, of the existing regulatory and management gaps uh, for the future implementation of, of the agreement. Uh, that was uh, very, very helpful. And as a result of that assessment, uh, we developed a proposal of a um, multi-stakeholder governance mechanisms that I can share, which include uh, all the competent institutions, civil society organizations, academia, IPLC organizations, etc. For for the participation uh, uh, at COP one, uh, we we are planning to to attend with, at the level of the um, our vice minister of foreign affairs a delegation combined between the Foreign Affairs and, and Environment Ministry. Uh, and, and for that, we took a, a series of uh, working groups uh, with the participation of more than 700 actors across the country um, with the idea of also identifying implementation progress, gaps and needs, and also to develop, to start developing already uh, proposals and programs uh, to be able to present to international community, international cooperation, uh, and a roadmap that goes even beyond uh, COP, COP1. As, as some examples of these findings of this process or preparatory process, I can mention some developments in terms of legal and public policies, uh, especially with regard to transparency and access to environmental information and participation. One of those, I already mentioned the, our first action plan for an open government. Um, the second, perhaps, and the most important one is, is Executive Decree 59, um, enacted at the very beginning of, of the current government period, which clearly promoted, very specifically in the Article 3, uh, the, the, the need to promote the implementation of the CASU Agreement with special emphasis in the respect and application of its principle uh, containing Article 3 of the agreement. Uh, that decree also involved a, a, an overarching public policy for several uh, other environmental programs, since it established uh, not only the change of name of our Ministry of Environment to Ministry of Environment, Water and Ecological Transition, but as actually a, a, a cross-cutting um, policy that um, share or expand the responsibility between the state and all the sectors uh, and actors of our economy and society to protect the rights of nature that we also have uh, as constitutionally protected, uh, but also to transform the current systems of production and consumption to achieve a sustainable, clean, low emission and resilient economy. That vision of ecological transition, which is um, only emerging in, in some countries, also became uh, one of the priority axes of a national development plan, 
uh, with the mandate to develop incentives for the protection of nature, threatened capacities, and guarantee the access to environmental information, participation, and justice. Other concrete examples under the information pillar, we, we have, I can also mention the National System of Environmental and Sustainability Indicators, our Agricultural Geoportal, our National Energy Assessment, our Biodiversity National Database. Uh, under the participation pillar, I can highlight the important tool of the Red Plus programs, which or framework, which include a process of free prior and informed consultation with local communities and indigenous peoples uh, for the develop development of climate change mitigation and adaptation projects. Um, also, the emergence of local producer platforms or the development of local environmental education councils in several provinces. Under the environmental justice pillar cycle, I can also share the case of the prosecution by the state to several cases of illegal deforestation, uh, possession and trade of wildlife, and several judicial decisions, uh, including by our constitutional court. Some of them uh, are at least a few, of the, a couple of them, even before the entry into force of the Escazú Agreement, condemning different acts as crimes against flora and fauna, uh, using some of the provisions of the Escazú uh, Agreement. Um, the General Prosecutions Prosecu uh, Office also established last year a special unit for the investigation of crimes against nature. And in 2019, the Judicial Function Academy uh, provided also capacity building to around 40 judges, prosecutors, and public defenders to enhance their knowledge and ability to implement environmental law. Of course, there are still gaps and even some barriers uh, in some cases, lack of knowledge of in several public entities about the existence of this CASU agreement, lack of capacity to implement uh, and facilitate its access, uh, and lack of coordination between different levels of public administration. Um, but we also have several opportunities, COP1 being perhaps a big, big main opportunity to, to expand the knowledge and starting of the implementation. But we also would like to, to connect and with this, I will finish with other processes. We have very soon a Stockholm Plus 50 conference, a, a, the Ocean Conference, BRS, Triple COP, COP15 of CBD, the Certification COP, COP27 on climate change, and, and the new process of negotiation of a, of a plastic, an agreement on plastic pollution. We believe that all these opportunities uh, and the example and this tool, a very important tool for, for Latin America, uh, provide us with the, with the opportunity to enhance the participation from a bottom-up approach, uh, not only to the implementation of the Escazú Agreement, but to the implementation and participation uh, of all actors in all these other environmental processes. So very, very glad uh, and very looking forward to the COP first starting tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Walter. This is really excellent uh, information and examples of uh, the way you are dealing with this issue um, in, in Ecuador. And, and it also, in a way, illustrates why we on our side are so excited to, to see this event, because it also gives a lot of food for thought around how we can on our side uh, also deal with this perhaps in different ways. And I look forward that we will have in the future uh, some kind of growing exchanges between the Aros community and the Escazú community because we definitely have a lot to, to learn and, and reinforce each other in, in, in this work. So um, let's turn now to another uh, Latin American country, I should say a Central American country, uh, which is uh, Mexico, who's also very much involved on in these issues, uh, linking human rights and the environment. And if I'm right, Montserrat Rovalo, uh, you are uh, especially in charge of human rights and environment issues at the permanent mission of Mexico at the UN here in, in Geneva. So once again, we see how a number of countries are making this link uh, very, very uh, concretely. So Montserrat, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eve. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank to Earth Justice, the Geneva Environment Network and European Eco Forum for organizing this event and inviting us to participate in it. Um, well, indeed, I mean, the, the, the ESC agreement uh, for Mexico is a very relevant instrument uh, to strengthen democracy, citizen participation, and environmental justice, and it has become a reference point for cooperation and regional integration. And it, it represents a commitment uh, to promote environmental governance and sustainable development. And it's also a prevention tool. Uh, Mexico, indeed, has a very strong uh, mandate um, in order to mainstream human rights and gender issues in different environmental forums, and this is not the exception. And, and as was mentioned before, now that this agreement is in force, uh, the big challenge ahead 
is uh, the implementation of, of, of the agreement. And Mexico has already in place significant pieces of legislation related to access rights on environmental matters. In fact, uh, the Mexican legislation influenced the drafting of the Escazú Agreement. However, there is still work to do to, to implement effectively this agreement. And in this regard, I would like to mention uh, some of the actions that Mexico has been taking uh, to, to implement uh, for roadmap uh, to implement this, this convention. Uh, first, Mexico um, has uh, promoted a multi-sector collaboration and has created subgroups, working groups at the government level, created to attend each type of access rights. So one for access to information, one for public participation, one for access to justice, and to formulate a roadmap for the implementation. And each group has identified strengths and adjustments uh, required to ensure uh, the full access to environmental and human rights. Um, the second uh, action that Mexico has taken is parallel work with the Academy for the development of indicators um, that can help us identify and evaluate the effectiveness of the policies and actions promoted by different actors uh, to implement the agreement. And third, uh, a series of dialogues with representatives of civil society have been taken uh, to learn uh, uh, from the different contributions uh, already in place in, in, in relation to access rights, but also uh, to, to see the way in which they can strengthen the general efforts taken uh, by the government. So these are some actions that have been uh, taken by, by, by the Mexican government. Um, now, as Roberto mentioned, uh, with the COP ahead of us, um, there are several objectives from this COP, uh, including the adoption of rules of procedure of the Conference of the Parties, the uh, rules relating to the structure and functions of the Compliance Committee, financial provisions, and strategies for effective implementation of the agreement ahead. Uh, what is Mexico expecting uh, from, uh, from this COP? Uh, they can be summarized in three main points, I would say. One is to have processes in place to include civil society, academia, and the private sector in national efforts to achieve the objectives and rights set forth in the Casu Agreement. And in this regard, the inclusion of youth, indigenous people, women, and general public in decision-making processes, as well as in spaces where they can share their experiences, and it's, it's very relevant. I mean, they must be a, re a reference in formulating effective climate and environmental uh, solutions. Um, a second um, point that Mexico is looking forward to this COP is the, to create synergies between the three uh, rights promoted by this Casu Agreement and the SDGs. We think that it's very important uh, to, to have this connection. And the third point I would highlight is uh, the importance of having coordinated response to different environmental and social challenges regionally. This is a very relevant instrument because it allows for different uh, countries in the region to, to join uh, ideas and forces to, to attend uh, social and environmental challenges that we may have in common. And in this sense, Mexico also believes that uh, this first uh, conference of the parties uh, will serve as a forum uh, to strengthen this cooperation and also as an example for other regions to implement similar mechanisms as the one that we have in the Escazú Agreement. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I will leave it here in case there are any further questions. I would be very uh, glad to, to, to answer them. And, uh, and yeah, well, this is just trying to highlight some of the main issues that we are looking forward uh, for the Conference of the Parties. Thank you, Yves. Thank you very much, Monserrat. And uh, in a way, you continue the very interesting list that uh, Walter on his side has also uh, started. Uh, and it's really interesting to see all the different ways we can implement such an agreement at the national level uh, and, and how much conference of the parties, as well as the different meetings that can happen on the side of such an instrument can help uh, develop national uh, efforts. So let me turn now to the last of our Latin American uh, state representative. Um, who is Mrs. Carla Giovannoni from, uh, from the permanent mission of Uruguay here in Geneva. Uruguay is also playing a very, very active role in linking human rights and the environment. We see this here in, in Geneva. We know that also you do have very important actions at the national level. So Carla, thank you for being with us and, and the floor is yours. 
Thanks so much uh, to you, uh, Yves, and uh, and good morning or, or good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's uh, it's really a pleasure to be to be here today with uh, many many great experts and also uh, some some familiar faces from Geneva. I would like to start uh, by thanking, of course, the Geneva Environmental Network and Earth Justice and the European Eco Forum for organizing these events, and of course also for inviting Uruguay to be to be part of the panel in the context of of the first um, meeting of the conference of the parties of the Escazú agreements. I think uh, we all uh, share the, the, the excitement on, on this uh, upcoming meeting. Uruguay um, has a long-standing position regarding um, promoting and maintaining um, human rights commitments um, with regard to access to information, access to public participation, and access to justice. There are key pillars of sound environmental governance. Um, and has been doing this uh, not only through the development of national legislation um, and policies, um, many of them that are um, older than the Escazú Agreement, but also at the international level, for example, by being one of the uh, states that the Rio Plus 20 conference held in 2012, declared the political will to work together to materialize the application of the 92 Rio Declaration Principle 10. Um, as, as we all know, and it has been said here um, already, uh, the Escazú Agreement is the first regional environment agreement in Latin America and the Caribbean, and also uh, proudly the first binding instrument uh, that contains specific obligations and provisions on human rights defenders that work in, in environmental issues. So we um, would like to uh, stress that we acknowledge, of course, the crucial role of um, environmental human rights defenders and the significant contributions toward reaching global climate and sustainable development goals. And, and we hope, of course, that the implementation of the Escazú Agreement will contribute to strengthening our region capacities uh, to guarantee a safe and enabling environment for the work of environmental human rights defenders. Um, we also want to highlight um, as a really positive point that the agreement reflects the importance of the access rights uh, that were, I think, also mentioned before by Mexico. I mean, the right of access to environmental information, public participation in the decision making process, and also access to justice in environmental matters. And all this, of course, linked to guaranteeing the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment for present and future generations. And in that regard, we didn't want to miss the opportunity of, of, of highlighting. Um, that, that, of course, thanks uh, to the leadership of many countries like Costa Rica, that it's also here today. Um, we were also proud of supporting last year a historic Human Rights Council resolution that recognized the, the human rights to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment uh, for the first time in the UN system. And uh, we, of course, we welcome this important step, step, and we understand that there's still a long way to ensure a practical impact on the ground of, of this recognition including uh, through the recognition in other UN bodies uh, and other, of course, international treaties, um, as well as on more constitutions and legislations in order to accelerate our global response to the triple global environmental crisis. Um, we agree also with uh, some panelists uh, before us that um, were um, speaking about the, the synergies between this recognition and, and um, what we are going to be discussing in the, in the COP1. Um, starting uh, tomorrow. Um, regarding more specifically the, the COP1, um, Uruguay emphasized that the adoption of balanced practical measures that foster transparency and the effective implementation of the Escazú Agreement would be important and also send a very positive signal to the countries of the region that have not yet uh, ratified it. Um, also, we are of the view that, um, as a general rule, the meetings will be held every two years at ecological characters in Santiago, unless, of course, the state parties decide otherwise, and uh, that we will be meeting also um, additional for the first years uh, of the agreements, uh, having the possibility, for example, of holding extraordinary meetings um, when needed in accordance with the Article 15 of, uh, of the agreement, especially in these uh, first years in which um, we still have uh, a lot to do. Um, I also would like to add um, that Uruguay is, is committed also to promote this regional treaty at the international level, and that's why we have uh, been part of um, organizing some events, for example, last year, 
um, we organized together with Costa Rica and NICLAC uh, um, side event of the UN High Level Political Forum, specifically on the Scassu agreements. And we are now organizing also a side event with similar characteristics, but within the framework of the Stockholm uh, Blue 50 International Conference that will uh, be in Sweden uh, next June. Um, finally, I um, just wanted to, to say that we um, aligned to um, what was expressed uh, bef um, before by um, Alicia Barcena, uh, the Executive Secretary of the CLAC, that it's important to remember that the Escazú Agreement is an agreement between states, but above all, it's also a pact between each state and its societies. So it collects regional priorities, recognizes and develops fundamental democratic rights and places equality at the center of development, seeking to incorporate all sectors of society to face environmental challenges. And this, in fact, has also been recognized by OHCHR, um, I mean, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and by many panelists uh, before me. And it's important to say the treaty provides a cornerstone for environmental democracy and as well as to international cooperation and, and multilateralism. Um, finally, we just wanted to reiterate that Uruguay is firmly committed to advancing the effective implementation of the SCASU agreement and uh, to express uh, the need also to redouble efforts in the region for more Latin American and Caribbean countries to ratify it. Um, we wish, of course, everyone a successful uh, first COP and we really look forward to, to hear the rest of, of the panelists and, and possible comments uh, from their own. Uh, thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Carla, and, uh, and indeed, uh, everybody's looking forward for uh, more and, 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 and full ratification from all of the, the states of the region, that's, uh, that's for sure. But thank you for giving us this uh, completing, I would say, the list of the examples of what's being do done at the national level. And I really want to thank all of the uh, Latin American state representatives for their excellent uh, uh, and very concrete examples showing how this instrument is, uh, is active at the national level and, and also making a bridge between different sectors and different uh, geographic areas. Now, precisely speaking about different geographic areas, the last of our uh, state representative in, in, in this panel is Mr. Orima Saladius. Uh, Mr. Orima Saladius is the chair of the uh, ARUS uh, Convention, or to be perhaps more precise, the chair of the Bureau of the uh, ARUS Convention. Uh, Mr. Saladius, we are really very happy uh, that you joined us, and uh, we're looking forward to hear what uh, you, as chair of the ARUS uh, Convention, uh, how do you see this first meeting of the this first conference of the parties of the Escazú Agreement? Uh, the chair is yours. The floor is yours. <laughs> Apologies. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the floor. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, colleagues, depending on where you are at the moment. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to address you today in my capacity as the chair of the Bureau of the Meeting of the Parties to the Arthur's Convention. Today is truly a happy day. We are celebrating the first conference of the parties to the Escazú Agreement which starts tomorrow. And, and this remarkable event is a strong reminder that environmental democracy is of global relevance now more than ever. Uh, as you might know, the Aarhus parties and stakeholders from the region were strongly engaged in the process that led to the Escazú Agreement uh, since its adoption in 1998. Uh, the Aarhus Convention has been a model example of the application of Principle 10 of the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. 20 years later, after its entry into force in 2001, the lessons learned demonstrate how environmental democracy can help sustainable management of resources, promote transboundary cooperation, and lay the foundations for peaceful, inclusive, and just societies. Testimonies by governments and stakeholders showcase time and time again success stories in different countries. The convention brought more transparency, it increased participatory approaches, and the free access to information became a standard practice. There is also a growing use of uh, administrative and court procedures by public, and these achievements bring many hopes for the future. At the same time, the lessons learned also served as a reminder of the importance of democratic values. Many societies are moving away from them towards greater restrictions on civil liberties, and environmental, env uh, environmental activists are increasingly the targets of repressive measures and retaliatory actions. It is crucial that people exercising their environmental rights be free from fear. 
Under Article 3 of the Aarhus Convention, parties shall ensure that persons exercising their rights in conformity with the provisions of the Convention shall not be penalized, persecuted, or harassed in any way for their involvement. It is crucial that environmental defenders be able to exercise their rights under the Convention without fear. As you are no doubt aware, Europe is experiencing unprovoked and relentless violence at the moment in the form of the Russian Federation's war in Ukraine. In times such as these, we are once again reminded of the importance of democratic values and free speech, as it has been proven time and time again that during military conflicts, environmental activists often face increased risks. Therefore, it is important to ensure environmental defender safety not only inside their home countries, but at international level as well. Uh, in this regard, I particularly commend the adoption of the landmark decision establishing the Aarhus Rapid Response Mechanism for the protection of environmental defenders in October last year. Both the Escazú Agreement and the Aarhus Convention provide solid frameworks and international standards for promoting transparency, good governance, participatory decision-making, and the rule of law, which are, uh, which are all at the heart of sustainable development. These treaties are effective tools at the service of governments and civil society to further SDGs, in particular SDG 16. I am also pleased to know that the Escazú Agreement embraced strong provisions safeguarding environmental defenders. Let me conclude by congratulating governments and civil society in the Latin America and the Caribbean region and the Secretariat for the agreement, which uh, with a remarkable achievement um, in reaching the Escazú Agreement, your tremendous work illustrates the value of environmental democracy in practice. And I can assure you that the Argos parties stand ready to continue sharing their knowledge and experience with you. Let us all unite efforts to transform our world to a more sustainable and prosperous place for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arimas, for these very strong words. Uh, and uh, these are really great steps for the future collaboration between Escazú and, uh, and the Arus uh, community uh, going both ways. Uh, actually, we both have to learn each other from uh, all the progress we'll be able to, uh, to, to achieve. Um, now, let me turn to someone who is very important in, uh, for this uh, first conference of the, of the parties, who is Mr. Joey Luis Samaniego. Uh, Mr. Uh, Samaniego, thank you very much for joining us. You're joining us uh, from Santiago. You are the Director of Sustainable Development and Human Settlement Division of UNECLAC. UNECLAC is the Secretariat of the uh, Escazú Agreement. So a very great thank you for joining us in such a very heavy time as uh, you will be uh, you're very much involved in, in, in the work that will start tomorrow and that already is starting uh, in part today. So, uh, Mr. Samaniego, we've heard how much the Escazú Agreement con covers access rights, uh, protects defenders, uh, is supposed to be promoted at the international level in international fora, and as it was said, uh, makes a link <laughs> between the states and the societies. Now, on your side, from uh, your side of, uh, on the vision of from UNECLAC, what are your expectations? What do you see as a, a possible outcome of this first conference of the parties? And once again, thank you very much for being with us. Well, first of all, thank you, Eva. Thank you very much for the outreach to ECLAC directly. And uh, thank you to the Geneva Environmental Network, to, to the Aarhus Convention that has effectively been with us all along this process, <clears throat> and to Earth Justice, and of course, to the countries that have taken this uh, nice initiative, let me say, that uh, so gratefully uh, surprises us. We are focused here working in Santiago on the proceedings of the COP, the organization, everything. So having this event in Geneva really makes us feel more <laughs> like sharing in a community that is not only here with us, but it's uh, of a global of a global reach. So thank you for, very much for the event. You have mentioned many of the characteristics of the Escazú Agreement. Uh, the process was unique, of course, which allowed for very meaningful public participation and of experts' participation, which led eventually to a much stronger agreement than would have been otherwise. And we hope, and this is one of the first expectations we have, is that uh, this translates into the rules of procedure by the countries agreeing to very strong, meaningful participation of the public, of academia, of the private sector, as has been the practice throughout the whole nine rounds of negotiation of the Escazú Agreement. 
Of course, we also hope uh, that we agree on the financial arrangements necessary for the operation and implementation of the agreement, Articles 14 and 54B, and on the rules for the composition and functioning of the implementation and compliance support committee. Let's remember that the Escazú agreement is above everything else, a cooperation agreement. But there are other things that we hope come from this COP1 of the Escazú agreement. First of all, we have seen in the region an increasing support from key stakeholders that may increase the ratification of the agreement and the effectiveness of the agreement. As, as Uruguay and Mexico were saying, this is a preventive agreement that is aimed at lowering social and economic and, uh, and environmental risks in decisions made. So we have an increasing participation in the events and the discussions of the financial community, and we hope that will be strengthened. You can see that already in the organization of the COP1 and the, and the commemoration sessions, particularly on Friday, where we have the participation of the World Business Council of AFD, the Agence Francaise de Développement. We have also the World Bank participating alongside with the public. So we're hoping that the Escazú Agreement really convokes a, a very plural participation and convincement that this is an appropriate instrument to make investment decisions, development decisions, at the same time that it takes care of people and communities. There are some other side effects of this COP1 uh, that we uh, expect. One is to lessen the opposition within Congresses of countries like Colombia, Costa Rica, and in Chile too, for further ratification, because Escazú is changing the narrative of what it means to take care of the environment while at the same time making sound investments. So we hope that, that the Congress is really inclined towards uh, ratification and hopefully gain the support of key industries, basically extractive industries, mining, oil, forestry, to support the, the, the procedures, the, the, the checklist, let's call it for simplifying reasons, of what Escazú means to decide investment with uh, appropriate information, participation, and access to justice. But no less important is what Mexico said. If we have indicators of performance, if we have cooperation for implementation, we must develop indicators. And indicators is a field of cooperative work throughout Latin America that will produce necessarily a periodic report on the state of implementation of Escazú, which we hope to produce every year, uh, but it also means that we have to cooperate on agreeing on substantive matters. If we have similar problems, we should have somewhat similar approaches to solving those problems, which means harmonizing public policies, harmonizing regulatory frameworks, allowing for the greener, more envir environmentally sound industries to appear in the region, which are more compatible with nature and with our own societies. So this means if we put in place the, the, the rules of procedure, the financial mechanism and the um, implementation committee, we are opening the door to a very, um, to a stronger cooperation in substantive matters throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, which we hope is the way for a more sustainable development. Thank you very much, Eve. Thank you very much, Jose Luis, and uh, we understand very well the challenges that you're facing these days, so we're all with you, uh, and we will read uh, to the UN uh, ECLAC Secretariat and to the whole of the uh, Conference of the Parties uh, starting tomorrow. Uh, and thank you very much for having taken the time to, to be with us. Um, now, there will be also a very important actor in uh, starting tomorrow, and actually they've been mobilized right from the beginning in, during the negotiation, that are the uh, indigenous organization and the civil society organization. Uh, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Natalie Perez, who is Earth Rights International's representative. Um, and she's more than that, because she's also the representative of the public at the Escazú Agreement. Natalia, thank you for being with us. Uh, we're very happy to have this uh, voice from the civil society. Uh, this is an event which is being co-organized by a number of uh, civil society from, uh, from our regions. 
And um, you've been hearing just now what uh, Jose Luis said about the challenges um, to which the, uh, the Escazo agreement can help bring answers. Um, how do you view this agreement? How, what are your expectations for this first meeting of the Conference of the Parties? Natalia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yves, and, and thank you uh, for this invitation. And thank you in general to all our colleagues in Europe that have uh, gave us uh, a great amount of support during the whole negotiation process of the Escasu Agreement. Um, I think that civil society and the public in general in the region comes to this COP with great hopes. Uh, after uh, a very long process of negotiation and pre-negotiation that started in the years prior to, to Rio Plus 20, it's just a, a great honor to, to be here now in Santiago preparing for this first COP of the Paris. And I think I, I also want to recognize uh, all the parties that are here and the ones that are not here of the agreement that um, because of the ratification is that Escaso is now in force and we're now here preparing for this COP, uh, this first COP of, of the Escaso agreement. And I think there are, there are so many hopes from, from civil society and from the public. So just, I'm, I'm going to focus on, on three or four of those ideas. Uh, first one, uh, I think this is a moment to make sure that Escaso uh, is no longer just a, a piece of paper, uh, a treaty that countries have signed, but a real tool uh, for people in Latin America and the Caribbean to ensure that uh, there is a, a right to a health environment and, and to make sure that we can uh, promote climate action in the in the region. And I think that's really important in a, in a historic moment where we just have two new IPCC reports telling us that there is a, the moment to act is now to, to stop the, the climate crisis. And that that action should be um, should be made by with rights based policies that include people, that include indigenous communities, that include frontline communities in the adoption of climate policies. And I think that's that's why Escazú is so important for for Latin American and the Caribbean countries because we already have that tool to make sure that climate action uh, is is effective in this region. The second idea that I wanted to to share. And I think is, uh, this is something that has also been um, mentioned by, by some of the state representatives, is also renewing the political commitment um, of the region with Escazú. I think it's, it's very important that now, uh, tomorrow we'll, we're having uh, the president of Chile in the opening ceremony, and the comeback of Chile to the Escazú process is, is really something that we're really looking forward. Chile, uh, along with Costa Rica, were the two countries that were leading the process for so many years. So I think that the, the, the fact that Chile hadn't uh, signed uh, the agreement was something that was uh, um, uh, not very good for us. So I think that uh, having Chile coming back to the Escazú process is, is really a, a great example of, of that political leaders, uh, leadership that we're hoping Chile can have. Uh, but also there are so many other countries that are still lacking that were mentioned in as, for example, Colombia or Brazil. So we're really hoping that this, this COP is also a moment to, to raise that commitment, not only by state parties, but by those signatories that are in due of ratifying the agreement. Uh, also, as has been mentioned, uh, the COP is going to be adopting the rules of procedure uh, for future COPs. And I think that for, for civil, from the civil society, from the public perspective, the importance of making sure that those rules of procedure really strengthen uh, the, the, signif the significant participation of the public in the COP and in all the different bodies that have been created by the agreement is really important. Escazú has not only been recognized because the agreement uh, created all these important standards on access rights and the protection of defenders in the region, but it also, has also been recognized because of the way that it was negotiated and the standards in terms of civil society, public participation in the negotiation. So I think that our expectation is really that those standards are strengthened and to make sure that civil society and the public and environmental defenders, indigenous uh, representatives are able to, to exercise an effective participation uh, at COP and the, any other organism and the other, other bodies that are created. My last point, and I think that uh, this is the core and this is the heart of what is going to be negotiated uh, for civil society during this week, uh, is the rules of the committee to support implementation and compliance. We have a proposal that, um, that, that is going to be um, discussed by, by the COP. 
uh, that was put forward by Costa Rica, Panama, Saint Lucia, and Uruguay. Uh, and we really thank those those countries and the secretariat because we know that the proposal is is very strong and it has taken a, a, a huge amount of work to put it together. Uh, but we really support the proposal because we think that, well, in general, as has been mentioned here, uh, the, the committee to support the implementation of compliance is really key to make sure that ESCASU is being implemented, to offer that support to parties and to authorities to implement the agreement, but also to make sure that there is accountability from states. Uh, and there is the transparency on how those obligations that are that were born in ESCASU are being implemented at the national level. The, the committee also will offer a, an expert interpretation of the agreement, which I think, which I think is, is also key to make sure that there is a, a, a legal expert committee that is able to interpret the, to, um, to interpret the agreement uh, for, for authorities to, to apply it at the national level. Uh, but also to make sure that that committee has also a, a significant and broad participation of the public. And in, in specifically, well, there are so, so many rules that are important uh, uh, in the rules that are going to be discussed this week. But I wanted to, to, to briefly mention uh, two or three that I think are, are the key elements that as civil society, as public, we're really hoping that these uh, rules could contain. The first one is, of course, the, the nature of the of the committee itself and and the fact that the members are really independent and that they are exercising their their job in an independent way uh, the second one is the possibility of of the public uh, to submit communications about the compliance of the agreement to that committee i think that's that's for us is the key of this week of of the negotiations at cop and is the heart of this proposal because this is the rule that allows uh, for real accountability and real transparency uh, by state parties in, in regards to their to their obligations in ESCASU and the way that they're implementing the agreement. And this was something that civil society was, was trying to achieve in the agreement as, as, as it is in, in the Aarhus Convention that includes this as part of the agreement. ESCASU didn't uh, include this in the agreement itself. Uh, at that time, it was not possible, but it's, it's being included here in these rules. And I think just I want to reiterate that this is the heart of the proposal, and we really hope that this uh, that this rule is going to be approved this week. And then the other uh, very important role for civil society is that this committee is also having the the function or the mandate to adopt protection measures in favor of the members of the public that file a communication uh, and that they establish that they are in a situation of of risk of attacks or threats or intimidation. I think that's also a, a key element for civil society because it specifically um, develops Article 9 of the SCASU agreement and the, that fourth pillar that was adopted in, in, ter in terms of recognition and protection of environmental human rights defenders. So we believe this is a, a key mandate for the, for the committee to have and we, we hope that this is also adopted. So uh, I think I'm going to end my remarks there. Just um, reiterating that uh, civil society and the public is, is really uh, glad that this proposal has been set forward and we hope that it has the support of, of parties and that we end up this week uh, with a very uh, a strong set of rules uh, for the compliance committee. Thank you, Yves. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Uh, indeed, we totally share your uh, your expectations. Uh, we look really forward to see what will be the outcome of this uh, first conference of, uh, of of the parties. Uh, and indeed, the elements that you have mentioned are exactly what makes such an instrument so strong, and that uh, gives it also all its attraction. Uh, we have seen how much with the Aarhus Convention, uh, the public has felt more engaged, more involved. And in a way, see that uh, governments take their their word and wishes seriously, and it's not just a, you know a, a appearance and a, or just a show. So definitely, we this is an important meeting, and, and we look forward uh, to a successful, really a successful uh, outcome. And also, it's very interesting uh, what you said about the uh, importance of the, the the participation of the civil society and the indigenous peoples organization in the process of the negotiation. It's also something that we were able to, to witness and, and to share here in, with the uh, Aris Convention. And actually, um, Orima Saladius, as chair of the uh, Bureau of the, con the Aris Convention, in the Bureau meetings, uh, in, in, in its Bureau, has uh, an NGO as observer in the discussion. So this is a very good way to, to, to continue these type of exchange and, and build together uh, a very strong instrument. 
And finally, about the words you said about Chile, uh, we're happy to have someone uh, from Chile representing Chile in, um, in, in among the people who are attending this event. And we look forward to being able, if this is possible technically, uh, to give them the floor um, at, at the conclusions of the list of the spe of the speakers. So now we wanted also to have a, a view uh, of a, a region which is also very important in, in, um, in Latin America, which are the Caribbeans. Um, and we have the pleasure to have a message from uh, Ruth Spencer, who is a marine ecosystem uh, from the marine ecosystem protected area. And she's from Antigua and Barbuda. Now she has just landed uh, in, the, in Santiago. So in order to avoid having too many difficulties in reaching us, uh, she has sent a, a short video and I'm turning now to uh, the staff of the Geneva Environmental Networks, who's working very hardly behind the scene, uh, if it's possible to uh, share with us the video. Good morning, my name is Ruth Spencer. I'm from Antigua and Barbuda, small Caribbean island. And I'm currently the chair of the Marine Ecosystems Protected Areas Trust. What's in Escazú for local communities in Antigua? It's powerful for us because it gives us a voice in environmental decision making. We have lots of laws, we have a constitution, we have different mechanisms where we have information laws, we have comprehensive environmental legislation, but there's a big but, these laws are not enforced. And even though we have them, the local people hear about them, but they're not sufficiently educated on these laws that can take action. So as I go about the nation and mix with different groups, there are some people who understand the laws, they understand how to make complaints when things go wrong, but the majority of our local groups do not understand the laws. They were never taught about these laws. So Eskazu, my government's ratification of this agreement is powerful because we are using it to advocate, to speak out about a lot of the wrongs that are taking place. We have a diversification program ongoing that's leading to commercial investments in protected areas. And personally, I see no gain to the environment. The gain goes to investors, not to the people. And they contribute no benefits to our biodiversity. We have the Chinese with a big investment in our largest marine protected area. Over in the island of Barbuda, there's big millionaire residence being built in a Ramsar site, a Ramsar protected area site. And just as the COVID con conditions were improving, we are hearing about another investment in our largest wetland areas, comprising over 500 acres. Now we the people know these projects should not take place without consultations. We don't have a lot of information on them, but we see the changes taking place. We hear machine in the areas, lands are being cleared, trees, mangroves are being destroyed. So I don't understand what's going on, but we the people have no say in these developments that are planned for us. The problem is that as Judge Rita Joseph, who I met with in Grenada, said last week, it seems as if these developments are state secrets because you only find out about them when you see something or some information is leaked. So what am I hoping to achieve at the COP? I'm hoping that the Caribbean region can have a greater voice. We can build networks and partnerships to build capacities. Capacities that bring us to a higher level 
capacities where we have the knowledge and understanding of the legislation, of things like project appraisal, of bisecting, dissecting these projects and actually looking at cost benefit analysis. We have to build capacities in social accountability because we as the people have to hold the government accountable to the laws and the legislation that are in place. And we have to build strong alliances because when an individual speaks out, they're called names, they're called economic terrorists, they are harassed, they're threatened. We don't have no killings in the Caribbean, thank God for them. It's not like in Latin America, in Colombia, where you have over 200 killings already for the year. But when you're in a small country and you're called names, harassed and singled out, sometimes you lose your jobs. So I am going to Eskazu with this determination that I can build networks and partnerships, that the rules of procedures amplifies our voices. But remember what's here in the Caribbean, we have a voice and God has given me my voice for advocacy. Very clear and strong statement from uh, our friend Ruth uh, Spencer. And I think it's a very good example of how much an agreement like uh, the Escazo agreement can help uh, communities being feel and be more involved in uh, in the decision making process when it uh, concerns environment, and and as it has been said previously, how much uh, this is an instrument to change our way to proceed uh, when we deal with the environment in order to precisely progress in the direction of a sustainable uh, development and not an unsustainable one, as it remains unfortunately today a challenge uh, a bit everywhere. So now, um, the last speaker on our list, but uh, last and not the least, is uh, Mrs. Magdalena uh, Tortnaggi. Uh, Magda, <laughs> you, uh, you'll uh, allow me to call you like that, Magda. Um, you have been one of the prominent actors in the negotiation of the Oris Convention, and you're following very, very closely the, all the work under the Oris Convention since then, but you also have been very much involved in the discussions with Latin American partners in the development of the Escazo Agreement. So we are very happy to have with you, to have us, to have you with us, sorry, and uh, and to hear your testimony and your views on this first meeting of the parties of the uh, Escazo Agreement. Magda, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eve, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. I'm very happy uh, to be able to address uh, this event and uh, speakers and uh, good to see so many familiar faces with whom we have been working on Aarhus Convention or on the ESCASO agreement uh, for so many years. Uh, I'm representing also an NGO now, the Good Environmental Law Association which is a network of public interest uh, environmental lawyers and environmental scientists uh, with a membership from 11 countries of Europe and the United States. And uh, we would like to congratulate to the parties and uh, the signatories and representatives of the public on uh, this occasion uh, just before the first uh, conference of parties. As many said in, before me, uh, this will be really a crucial meeting when uh, basic documents uh, for the architecture and implementation of this outstanding agreement will be discussed and put in place. The rules of procedure and the uh, rules on the committee to support implementation and compliance of the agreement are two uh, very important building blocks for the implementation of this agreement. Um, therefore, it is critical that these would ensure not only the efficient implementation of the agreement, but do this in a very transparent way with the significant participation of the public, as Natalia mentioned and that uh, would include opportunities for the representatives of the public uh, to participate in the different leading bodies 
of the agreement, not only the future conferences of parties or subsidiary bodies, but also in the body of the so-called presiding officers with uh, one representative at least. And uh, we also would like to see and hope that the committee to support implementation and compliance will be formulated in a way that there will be the opportunity for the members of the public to submit communications to this committee when they experience infringements of their rights during implementation uh, period in the different countries. We also think that in addition to these uh, proposed documents, the drafts which are welcome, uh, the practice also will be followed when informal and informal drafting groups, uh, the representatives of the public also can uh, participate uh, personally in these meetings and can contribute this way to the preparation of the different documents or meetings. We would like to acknowledge the role of the civil society during the negotiation of this agreement and then uh, during uh, the promotion of the ratification of this agreement where uh, really uh, coordinated action, actions were taking place in many countries of the region and uh, the representatives of the public along with uh, the group of active civil society actors, environmental activists um, took part in, in, the, in the implementation of different campaigns, debates, dialogues, and thus contributed to this uh, successful ratification in many uh, countries. Still, there are other countries, a couple of them, where this process needs to happen. And we look forward to see that uh, from 12, um, parties, the parties' numbers will increase soon to at least 24. The, the, there are 24 countries now who signed this agreement, but 33 countries are included in the scope of this agreement. So we hope, uh, we wish a successful COP and hope that the parties uh, will support and ad adopt very forward-looking and progressive rules in these mentioned fields. When we come to the next steps and main challenges for the agreement, uh, in, in the first place, uh, we would like to see that the structure of the agreement is working, that uh, the practical implementation is starting, and the committee to support implementation and compliance is set up uh, rather soon after the first COP. Uh, also, uh, we would like to see that there is successful progress in the implementation, not only at the regional level, but at the national and subnational levels. So the public of the Latin American region and the most affected groups, including the environmental and human rights defenders and uh, indigenous communities can witness a difference in how they can practice their access rights, how they can defend their interests when exercise their rights to healthy environment during the future environmental decisions to be made. It is very important to have a dialogue also at the national and local level, not only at the regional level during COPs or different subsidiary other meetings. And uh, responsible national authorities, representatives of the public, different stakeholders should be involved and uh, discuss, identify where the biggest obstacles to the implementation of the agreement are and how this could be removed, what measures should be taken towards improvements. We heard a few very interesting uh, examples from Latin American speakers in this respect. Not only the awareness uh, uh, and the, of the authorities of the parties responsible for the implementation of this agreement uh, of their obligations and their capacities should be increased, but also the representatives of the public and the most affected group, they also should be made aware of their rights and how those rights can be exercised. 
Adequate, stable and predictable resources should be secured, financial resources for the implementation, but also human resources are needed. So the capacity building of authorities and especially judiciary, as well as the public, the civil society is also needed on regional, national and local levels. We very much hope that the donors from the Latin American region and outside the LAC region will also contribute to support the capacity building efforts and the implementation of the agreement at these levels. Um, we have heard from Jeremy and we agree that uh, each agreement should find their own ways and each part, each agreement's parties should find their own ways to implement the instrument. But uh, the exchange and cooperation between the ESCASO agreement and the Aarhus Convention and the sharing of experiences and good practices, we believe can greatly contribute to the successful implementation of both the ESCASO agreement and to the Aarhus Convention. We heard uh, from the chair of the parties of the Aarhus Convention meeting of the parties, but also we heard from the Bureau, the Secretariat of Aarhus Convention, and we can reiterate from the civil society side that we offer our support to the successful implementation of the ESCASO agreement also in the future. And uh, with wish, I would like to again, um, with this wish, or let's say uh, uh, with this, uh, yeah. So with this, I would like to wish a successful outcome for the upcoming uh, COP, and uh, we hope to follow it online from Europe your deliberations and thank you for the attention. I'm ready to answer questions if there is still time. Thank you very much, Magda. This was a very interesting, uh, very interesting element. And thank you for having also mentioned the, the secretariats of the Aarhus Convention, because I know that there has been a number of useful exchanges between the secretariats of the uh, Aarhus Convention and the secretariat, uh, which means UN ECLAC, of the uh, Escazu agreement, and we look forward for continuing this type of, uh, of exchanges. Now, uh, before I turn to the final comments that everybody will be able to do in a very short sentence, um, I'd like to use the opportunity to, for, of having with us uh, Mrs. Camila Marquez, who is the Deputy Permanent Representative of Chile in Geneva, if she would like to say a word of, uh, on behalf of, the, uh, of Chile as being host of this event in Santiago, and I hope we're able to connect with you correctly. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Marquez. Mrs. Marquez. Okay, so well, I, I'm afraid that we're having some difficulties and let me use this opportunity to uh, thank again uh, the Geneva Environmental Network uh, staff for all the work which is done behind the scene. We have encountered a few technical difficulties, even after two years of COVID and Zoom, we still have some challenges when we make all of these connections. And uh, we've been able to go forward smoothly, at least for this discussion. So once again, thank you to the team. Now, as we are uh, getting close to the, uh, to, to the end of this meeting, I think it's quite important uh, that everybody can have a very short final word and I'm asking uh, everybody to just do this in, in one uh, sentence. But I would like to start with uh, Joey Luis uh, Samaniego. Uh, I know also that you have to rush afterwards to other uh, obligations in the preparation of the, um, of the COP. You have heard also some of the expectations uh, from states as well as civil society. Uh, so let's start with these final sentence of conclusions with you, uh, José Luis, the floor is yours. I think, thank you very much for the opportunity. I think that the, both the expectations of the government from the point of view of the Secretariat, as well as those expectations from the public can be uh, reconciled, they can find a space. Escazú has been an exercise of democracy and we're convinced that Escazú is pushing the envelope in terms of democratic practices. So we hope we have a successful outcome. We hope that we can that, that the countries can accommodate the expectations of the public. There is precedent in the region of public submissions. So um, I think it, that's going to be a really interesting discussion. And let me finalize by saying that there's a, an increasing sense of empowerment within Latin America. 
uh, and that shows in other instances like the cooperation in CELAC II, where Mexico did a very fine, fine, fine role. We think that there's a very big chance that Escazú becomes the president, uh, elects as president of the Bureau Uruguay, who's always been a very positive force within the agreement. And I cannot finish without thanking Magdi and the Aarhus Convention for all the support along these 10 years of negotiation now that we have come to the first COP. Magdi, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose Luis, once again. And uh, all our thoughts are with you for the coming two days. Uh, we wish you really the best to you and to the whole of the conference of the, of the parties. Um, Magdi, you've just been very well mentioned. Uh, would you have one final word uh, of conclusion? It's a very short sentence. Yeah, thank you. I already wished all the um, good results and outcome, and thank you for your kind words, uh, 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 Mr. Samaniego. We just uh, continue. That is my, my last word. We will be in touch and hope that also our LAC colleagues uh, see the usefulness in our contribution. And uh, together, ESCASU agreement and Orhus Convention can also um, take part in other global processes uh, in different international fora, and we can take uh, joint initiatives. So we should further discuss after the first COP how this cooperation could evolve more. But now our attention are focused on the first COP. Thank you very much. And I will turn to, to Natalia and then we'll go uh, to the different uh, state representatives. Natalia, would you have one final sentence as a conclusion uh, or, a, or a call? I don't know. Thank you, Yves, and, and, and thank you to, the, to all the state representatives and finalists for their words. Uh, I think my, my last uh, message is just that we're really hoping to have a, a very productive and participative COP, first COP. I think there is, there is a lot of expectations from civil society, public, indigenous organizations in the region for this to be a space uh, where there is effective participation from the public. And then just calling again on all state parties to support the, those proposals put in forward, specifically the proposals for the rules of the compliance committee, which we believe is the heart of what is going to be negotiated during this week, and especially uh, because it allows the public to, to bring communications to that committee, which we believe is, um, is the key aspect to ensure accountability and transparency on the implementation of the SCASU agreement. Thank you. Thank you to you, Natalia, and I wish you a very successful, uh, very su 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 successful COP. Um, we will now turn to the state representative from Latin America, and I'll go in the reverse order then uh, that we heard them. Um, Carla, would you have a final word on behalf of Uruguay? Yes, uh, of course, and uh, thanks so much, uh, Ives, and uh, all, all the members of the panel has been super interesting to listen to everyone. Um, we just want to, to wish uh, states, uh, civil society, and all other stakeholders a really uh, fruitful COP and uh, with results that are aligned with the spirit of the agreement. Um, I'm not going to enter on the details of the different proposals with regard to the committee, but we do hope that we can all move together to keep advancing the, the effective implementation of the treaty and its wider ratification, and uh, emphasizing as well that this is at the same time an effort to strengthen our regional cooperation and our democracies, and also to, be to do better in applying a human rights approach to environmental policies. Thanks so much, Ives, and looking forward to, you know, to, to the COP tomorrow. Thank you very much to you. Uh, Montserrat, on behalf of Mexico. Thank you very much, Eve, and thank you to all panelists. It was very interesting to, to listen to all of you. Um, just uh, in, a, in a similar uh, thing to, to what Natalia expressed, uh, we think that it's important that the rights to access to information, public participation, and access to justice are not just uh, outcomes of, of, of the different instruments or different outcomes of the of, of this COP, uh, but also that those um, rights are realized and materialized uh, in the process to the adoption of these outcomes of the COP, and we think that that's very important. And we really hope to 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 have uh, a COP that gives a good example for other regions uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you to you. Uh, Walter, can we turn to you on behalf of Ecuador? 
Thank you. Thank you, Yves. And I'm sorry for <clears throat> not being able to turn on the camera and run into another meeting, but uh, just wanted to, to, to thank you. And, and, and really, we have listened carefully to all the, the different uh, comments, proposals, ideas. Uh, just wanted to stress uh, two final points. One is that we really should uh, take advantage and enhance the connectivity and the connection between this uh, COP1 and the work that is being undertaken in Geneva, uh, precisely be because of uh, being a, a tool to, to implement the, the recently, uh, relatively recently recognized rights to a healthy environment, to the establishment of a, a special reporter on, on climate change and human rights, and, and all the different works uh, of, of the Human Rights Council and of the different international organizations in Geneva that have a link, uh, direct or indirect, with uh, the implementation of the SCASU agreement. Uh, and the second point uh, also related to that is the, the, the aspect of the synergies that I mentioned uh, in my first intervention with other global processes. Uh, ESCASU being a, a very powerful tool that we should use not only in a region, but as an example from, for other regions uh, to, to enhance uh, the bottom-up approach uh, when building positions and, and reaching agreements and, and um, enhancing the implementation of all the different environmental multilateral agreements uh, in the framework of their COPs, but using the tool and the principles, the vision, uh, uh, and, and the, some of the measures, provisions uh, established in the, in the SCASU agreement as an example, or as a way to build those positions uh, and those agreements. Um, just those two points. And, and again, thank you. I'm looking for, for a continuation of conversation on these issues, um, in, either in, through Gene or in other forums. Thank you. Thank you very much, Walter. And now, uh, Roberto, from, uh, on behalf of uh, Costa Rica. Thank you, Eve. Um, I'd just like to, to echo uh, the words that, that Natalia said uh, earlier about the spirit of Escasu and what it has showed, right? The negotiation process and after even the negotiation process, there has always been a close collaboration between civil society and state parties and other actors, academia and even uh, private enterprises. Uh, we've had relationships with many uh, NGOs and international organizations such as the OECD. And this spirit of collaboration should also be present in Santiago for the first COP. It is a time in which we've now uh, exited um, uh, mostly the, the isolation of the last two years. So it should uh, not only be a productive COP, but a celebration of the achievement of Escasu being implemented and having reached the necessary uh, ratifications for it to come into, into force. So it's a, it's a big moment uh, and there should be a good spirit of collaboration with the, between everyone and uh, to bring about strong rules, as, as has been said, but also flexible rules, right? Uh, the, the rules of the compliance uh, committee should allow for the, for a large and, and significant participation of the members of the public and also be flexible for the members of the committee to find their own voice and, and find the own way of the SCSU agreement to work uh, for the future and of course with the ever uh, present collaboration and uh, participation of the public. So I just wanted to, to bring this message of uh, co collaboration and of good spirits that I'm sure will lead to a successful COP. Thank you. Final two words are uh, for the uh, for Orimas and uh, for Jeremy, as this is an event to uh, greet, welcome, and 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 send our best wishes to the first COP. So, uh, Orimas, as uh, chair of the Oris Convention, what would be your final uh, sentence? Thank you. Um, I want to congratulate the parties of the Escaso Agreement once again in the hopes in the hopes to continue our, as you mentioned, mutually beneficial cooperation between the Argus Convention and the Escazu Agreement, secretariats and parties. Um, and I have no doubt, no doubts that this agreement will bring positive change to, to Latin America and the Caribbean, and in turn will contribute to the global promotion of democratic values. So that would be my takeaway. Thank you so much. Thank you to you. And so, uh, Jeremy? Yeah, well, thank you, Eve, for also for your role in organizing this event. I, I, I think the two takeaways for me, one is just to very strongly agree with 
Uh, Natalia, I think she's absolutely right when she says that getting a strong compliance implementation mechanism in place and these two elements around the independence of the committee and the possibility of public trigger, those are very important. Whether they're winnable this week or not, I don't know, uh, but I think they are really important demands. And also Magda's mentioned the importance of the participation in the processes of the of the mechanism, or not the mechanism, but of the convention of the of the agreement generally, uh, really makes a difference to the content to have uh, representatives of the public in those processes. And fi my final comment is really just to say that an MEA is not just a set of rules, a set of documents, a set of agreements. It's also about a community. At the heart of every MEA, you have a community of people, of individuals individuals who are uh, public officials from representing their governments, uh, civil servants working in the secretariat, representatives of stakeholders, those individuals and what they invest in it makes a real difference to the outcome. This isn't a romantic idea. It is romantic, of course, but it's not only a romantic idea because we've seen how this works in, in two, more than two decades with the Oris Convention. So I, I would really encourage all of you who are part of that community to believe in that. And I hope this week, whatever comes out of it in terms of documents and agreements, formal uh, decisions, uh, that also it's an opportunity to strengthen and build, continue to build that community at the center of the Escazo agreement. Thank you. Very much, Jeremy, and I uh, totally agree with you for experiencing it, how much this can be and is a community. And then we look forward that the two communities can also progressively form one big community that can have quite an influence on the environmental issues on this planet uh, today. So uh, having said that, I want to really thank very warmly all of the speakers, all of our guests for what they have uh, shared with us uh, today. I hope that all our Latin American and Caribbean friends feel how much interest and how much uh, wish we are sending them. And we really wish you all the best for this first conference of the parties in Santiago starting tomorrow. With that, I now turn to Diana and to the Geneva Environmental Network team, thanking them for their work, thanking them for the support and their contribution to this event. And so, uh, Diana, the word is yours. Thank you, Eve. And as we are running out of time, I just want to thank you, Eve, uh, for excellently moderating this event. And also warm thanks to all our panelists and attendees that join us uh, today as well as to the various teams that were involved in the preparation of uh, this event. We look forward to the outcomes of the, the conference of the parties uh, and there are various events taking place in the margins of the conference. There have been a lot of announcements on social networks and other media, so we encourage you also to, uh, to join uh, some of uh, these events. Um, and we also took good note that stakeholders are prepare, preparing events um, at the Stockholm Plus 50 conference, so uh, a lot still uh, uh, to be continued and a lot of opportunities to join uh, the discussions. So with that, thank you all. And we look forward, of course, to welcome you all at uh, other events we are that are taking place uh, in the next weeks and months. Thank very you all much. for joining from all parts of the world. It was really a, a very interesting discussion and good to see, as Jeremy said, this is all about uh, people and, and, uh, and communities. So good to see all this enthusiasm today.